weekly podcast brought to you by Open Lettering 3%, in which for the next 10 episodes, we'll be discussing doing a deep dive on Praiseworthy by Alexis Wright, a book that just came out from New Directions on February 6th. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and I'm joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. That was a extremely mediocre opening. For well, that's not episode. the opening, though. That's not the opening. The opening <laughs> is our newest game, Facts you didn't know about Australia. So did you know, did you know that Australia has the longest golf course in the world? The longest golf course in the, the world. The longest course. golf course. It of is. Course I know that. I'm, I'm, it's what? It is 1,365 kilometers long, <laughs> which <What>? is... <laughs> fucking nonsense so it's all kind of a i hate golf i'm gonna say a lot of controversial stuff at the beginning of this episode and my dislike of golf is one part of it i think golf sucks and uh, i don't want to play it all right my my dad's livelihood and subsistence growing up was based on golf which maybe makes this kind of like even a little ruder but i'm not a fan so when i found out that they had the longest one i thought well that's another reason i don't know that i want to visit australia um, I don't want to get eaten by a bug. I don't want to. One fact that goes with that is the their greatest national export is Greg Norman. So <laughs> there you go. That's true, right? Yeah. So so this golf course is like located along a highway, crosses two states, and the <laughs> Nullarbor Plain. Um, it is it is set up so that there are roadhouses. It's like if you were driving, you would drive and play a hole of golf, and then drive to the next next hole and which is like a roadhouse you're getting increasingly drunk on fosters and uh and and playing golf each of these each of these holes it's 18 holes 72 power 72 that i think is normal question mark they mm -hmm. all have names to them and the names are like wombat hole dingo's dang <laughs> nullabore nymph <laughs> Eagle's Nest, 90 miles straight. There's one that has a Wikipedia entry of its own called Skylab, which feels like something out of a Terminator movie. But yeah, so Australia, you no know, lots of bugs, big ass spiders, and the longest golf course in the world. <laughs> Honey, I'm going to go golfing. Okay, I'll see you next week. It says it open twenty. You have, to have your, you have to have your oil changed. Your golf <laughs> cart has to have its oil changed. <laughs> For the, the tires rotated by by the third hole. They <laughs> said that like twenty thousand people. Um, oh, Skylab crashed in Australia, which is maybe where that that name comes from. So twenty thousand oh, people played this played this course, and then they believe that an equal amount, if not more, have illegally played it by not paying any fees because how are you going to know? How are you going to know? <laughs> that was like golf drones. <laughs> like, That's what, wild. What a ridiculous idea. So, Have you seen the beer cart person? Uh, about four days ago. I don't know if they're going to come back around, though. <laughs> I mean, this, is where, this is the land where babies have been eaten by dingoes, and I wouldn't be surprised if golfers were now as well. So there's that. Um, I also want to announce to everyone who's watching or listening that we have a ton of books that just came in. So Open Letter had a little bit of a hiccup in terms of getting books published because of personal reasons and then printer problems and then distributor issues, which I am legally not supposed to be talking about. So I won't, but let it be noted that our distrib distributor screwed up bits and pieces of this. If you're a subscriber, you're getting three books in the mail right now. And we have entered into our black phase. So we have Dubrovsky Greshik's newest book, The Culture of Lies, black and white cover. Did This Hand Kill? 
by I'm going to try it. Cesare Lazarus, Lazarus, ah, don't know. Nailed it. This is Nailed a great it. Polish true crime novel um, or, or reportage, work of Polish reportage. And then The Red Handler by Johan Harstad, which is branded as open letter pulp. Like we have our own detective, our detective logo and like a detective crime crime book for once. So this is Norwegian, also black, white, and red. We are in a deep black and white and red phase, which is- uh, Who translated that uh, that last book? The Red Handler, this is by David Smith translated this one. Okay. Which he, uh, he was a- Look at um, that back cover. Man. Hold up that back cover real quick. For those that are just listening, it's uh, red with like black blood, almost like oil, you know, as if oil is a bad thing that's destroying our lives it actually looks a lot like chocolate too okay <laughs> maybe make you a little hungry solid but i wanted to bring this up in part and this is going to be the controversial part and i want to like i want to frame this i want to frame this as best i can so that you know that i'm not trying to be harsh on anything because i do think that new directions has some of the greatest designed books and covers and whole vibe that they can have but we have had and this is a bit about maybe in the weeds, but might be of interest to some people. We have had a lot of trouble with printers recently. They we have sent off books that were supposed to be matte that come back glossy. There are like miscuts. There are innumerable delays. It's all like a real train wreck of getting things printed. And our distributor really wants us to use a, a thing called LSI, which is they would print to order the books. They would never have inventory. They don't want inventory except when they want to charge you for it. They just want you to like have a book in a system. They print the copies that they need. That's it. Um, no inventory, no, no waste whatsoever. And it's been found that those copies, which we've used them for galleys and certain other books, that there's like a 10 to 12% damage rate on those where it's misprinted, things are miscut, the wrong book is inside there, which is a pretty high percentage. All this, this is a frame. I wish this book, Praiseworthy, were slightly different in its design. Why? First of all, I think that it is too squat. I think it should be a six by nine book. So it was bigger rather than so thick. It's like an uneasy book to hold. And the page size seems weird given like its overall length. But more importantly, the galley came in and the galley was all matte. The galley feels amazing to read. I don't like these glossy covers and I don't know if yours has this, but there's my back is like off kilter, but on the front, there's like missing colors. Like it looks like there's like strips on the front of like a part and then a non-colored part as if something just went awry. And I'm like, bring this up because it's, it's, we live in a world in which our distributor does not want books to exist. Basically. They just want them as like widgets that they can check <laughs> And bookstores are, you know, there, but like are there in certain ways. And there used to be like, I think of like books as like the ownership of books in one way being like a process of digesting text, which is more or less what I do. I don't, I'm not a collector. I don't like have first edition issues or anything like that. I just digest the text. But there are like, I was showing my class, we we're doing a thing on production. There are beautifully created objects like this. Um, J.J. Abrams' book, S. it's also called Ship of Theseus, that has, like, fucking shit side of it, cards and handwritten documents, and is, like, a truly, like, something that's, like, worth owning. And even, like, Mark Daniel Luce, it's a familiar, that a series of books, they're, like, glossy pages, full color on the tips, like, bound in bookmark, you know, really interesting die-cut cover that's, like, at an angle even, like really beautiful productions. And uh, and I think that like the, the world that we're living in, I, I, my concern is that, that the world we're living, especially with our dis distribution like emphasis and their like, and their, their sort of push as to what we're doing is like letting go of like the beauty of the created book. And this book, given the Alexis Wright's like, reputation, I thought it was going to be like, I thought it was hardcover first of all, but I thought it would be like this really like, you know, thing. Well, I do have and, to say, I so kind I, of, yeah. I'm exact opposite of you. I think this is wonderful. It reminds me of those like Windows 98 books that you would get uh, or like how to do Excel. <laughs> <laughs> so ha, it, sure it takes me back to the good old days <laughs> of, uh, of how to navigate Microsoft Word and Office Suite.
So there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> I can make source. I do like the image. I like the donkey. I like the image. I like the, the I just feel like, like whatever. Someone's saying in the chat that the end other stories edition is five by eight with a white matte cover, thick but clear to handle for reading. Um, which I do believe like with a matte cover makes a big difference. The galley of this had a matte cover. It also had like paper that was slightly thinner, so it didn't feel so like chunky. This thing is a fucking chunky ass book. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's like fun nerd stuff that yeah. uh unless you're like really into books people don't care about this conversation at all i think it's fascinating I, I like i like to know how it's made why it's made you know now that i'm into more books than i'm just being a reader uh, i find that stuff fascinating absolutely absolutely for anyone not for anyone watching this or, or i guess for not watching it too you are frozen and i'm going to remove you and add you back in and see if that makes a difference Yeah, now you're moving. Now, you're, oh well, we'll just, I can hear you with it. All right, that's fine. Maybe hear you. Um, so, I don't know if there's anything I wanted to talk about before we talk a little bit about this. I think that, I, you know, this one's sort of worrisome for me. Like, I don't, this is a book and an author that I know like next to nothing about prior to starting this podcast and deciding that we would be doing this book. And, and Welcome to like my world. Past, That's every book. Almost... <laughs> Set myself up for like for determined failure. Um, but it was a book like I I knew I've heard of Alexis Wright only through the proliferation of discussions about her related to Australian book Twitter. Like there's a huge group of Australian readers who are like into open letter. They're into Delky Archive stuff. They're into like our podcast. They're into like these sort of books. And they, they talk about them a lot. They're very active um, and, and really smart and interesting people. And they've always mentioned, along with uh, Gerald Murnane, Mer 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 um, the as her, as Alexis Wright being one of the great contemporary Australian writers, full stop, amazing, dense, all over the place, like very like important, um, very, you know, unique in her style, so on and so forth. But like, I knew nothing, like literally nothing more than that um, before going into this, except that, that, that they loved her and that she was an Aboriginal author. Those are like the two facts, full stop, that I was aware of. Had you I heard can do of you her one before? better. No, I can do you one better. Like all I know about Australia comes from Bluey and Crocodile Dundee. So... <laughs> Like forget <laughs> authors. I don't even. I don't even know if like they're, they're an actual country. I, I'm not even sure. <laughs> I mean, they just, they just they just changed the continent name. I just caught up with that, you know, a couple weeks ago. So I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm like an infant wandering into the room. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna have all this all the strong opinions. <laughs> I, I am the world's only bluey hater. Like, I don't like that show at all. I think that it's a secret. I think secretly, if you were to question Bluey's dad just a little bit, he wants to kill himself and that every everything that he's doing on this show is solely to keep himself from suicide. <laughs> oh, man. Can you imagine, like, the dark turn it could take? Like, if his leash is attached to his collar and it's just, like, <laughs> dangling from the back porch. Like, Bandit! Where are you, Bandit? <laughs> and, the mom, and the mom's trying to hide it from the kids and so start playing a game with the, with, with the corpse. <laughs> like, let's do, let's oh, do. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> and he's struggling. The thing I can't, the thing I can't stand about that show is why are these parents always playing with their kids? Sometimes yeah. you just like kids go away. Like yeah. no, <laughs> go play with your sister. Go. <laughs> And people see this as like the great form of like, oh, this is great parenting. This is like, I can't ever live up to that. I'm like, why would you want to? Like those it's a cart it's a cartoon dog, so you go die. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not playing, I'm not playing with you. <laughs> not the bluey exists. I mean, this does tie into part of this book. Bluey exists so that you can put it on the iPad and get rid of your children for, th for three minutes. Uh. That's what they're there for. That's what it's there for. So there, I know some hey, Australian authors like Patrick White. 
Um, and you know, uh, who else? Richard Flanagan. I looked up a list of these and like was like, oh wow. The end. Morality. Morality. I don't didn't. I'm the Big Little Lies author. I didn't know. Never read any of her books. I didn't know that she was Australian. She's on here. Peter Carey. Oh, there's another book. another show coming out. Oh, I, really? You can throw in JM JM Cotier now. He's still at Adelaide, right? Oh, perhaps. You know, he's South African. He's true. You know, he he represents James Clavel. I can't wait. Has that new Shogun show out on FX that started this week. He's also on here. I didn't realize he was Australian. So there are Australian writers I know of, but for the most part, like I Greg Norman's think... written some books, I'm sure, probably on golf or something. But so that you can throw him on there too. The Great White Shark, <laughs> one thousand sixty-five <laughs> miles or <laughs> kilometers of my golfing life. Um, he probably designed Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin did some writing. Steve Irwin, yeah, he did some he did some good stuff, I suppose. <laughs> he, he was he was around, but like weirdly, Australia is like Canada, and I don't mean this as both being like sort of in that same historical bent, but in that like those their their authors are there, they're in English, and yet they don't travel very often to American shores. Um, we we're doing when John Kinsella is Australian writer that we're publishing through Delkey, but like generally speaking, they're like you know they're not they're not they're not made popular here. And it's like one of those like kind of baffling things at the same time is like says something about American like nationalism within the cultural sphere and just disinterest in various parts of the world. But like it is it's interesting that 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 they're just sort of, you know, cut off. Um, oh, you know, in addition to Bluey, what about the Simpsons Australia episode? That one's classic. That's a classic. Oh, the boot with the boot uh, and kick him in the ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the invasive species, the, the toilet flowing the wrong way. Um, yeah. All the all the fun stuff. Fosters, where uh, Marge is like, can I have a coffee? And they're like, beer. <laughs> like, coffee. A beer. <laughs> like, there's nothing, there's no coffee to drink. So not that, but like, yeah, generally like pretty overlooked. So I know. Did little... you ever read the short story? Uh, First contact with the Gorgonids. No, it takes place in the in the outback. Really? Yeah, that's another you know literary Australia reference, but that's a, a great short story about uh, this this guy. He's like an ugly American, and uh, him and his wife uh, they get told to go out in the middle of nowhere, and they encounter aliens. Uh, but the guy's so stupid, he thinks they're aboriginals. And so he's like, dancey, dancey, come on. He's like trying to film them and stuff. And <laughs> she's like, maybe you should ask for permission. He's like, permission? Shit. You think people in National Geographic ask for permission? <laughs> Just like yeah. filming them and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's a really funny story. It's written um, by uh, Ursula Le Guin. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. no, know that one. But... Yeah, first contact with the Gorgon is like super ugly Americans in Australia. It's wonderful. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So I did a little bit of research and I was hoping that we can have over the course of these like next nine episodes, I suppose, some guests come on who are from Australia or have like a greater experience with her writing or with like the, especially the politics. So there was an article. In that the New would Times. be lovely. It would be super helpful because like yeah. you were saying beforehand, like we'll get to the style of the book, the book itself, but like the, um, mm -hmm. the general like approach to it sort of requires some ancillary reading to just get a handle on like what the scope of things are, I think. And it's in a way, it made me think when I first started, I read part of her other big book that New Directions released, um, uh, Carpentaria. And in that too, I had the impression of like, this isn't dissimilar from reading a translation. Like this is a world I'm not automatically familiar with. Um, the language is unique, the style is unique, but like this is the background of like where it's coming from is it feels distinctively foreign in a sense. And so like, I, the, I'm curious how you approach that just as a just general, general response to the book itself. Um, and like where within the knowledge that you have of Australian literature, Aboriginal politics, like where this, how this kind of lands. Well, I think for just like jumping into it and reading it, um, super disorienting the first maybe like 40 pages, right? Yeah. Like trying to get the, the feel and the flow. It doesn't read like, you know, we'll call it Western, like traditional Western texts. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like that. 
which I like because um, mm-hmm. you, you get kind of bored with <laughs> your like smelling your own shit all the time. So it's nice to smell somebody else's. <laughs> Ooh, that's gross. I don't know why they went that way, but sorry. <laughs> I mean, there's um, a lot of talk in this section. Sure. So. Um, so it was very disorienting, but like I didn't try to figure anything out. And I actually like not knowing anything because you just let it wash over you and just swim and just figure it out. And that's cool. And I think it's a great way to experience things. Just like, here, check this out. Like, no warnings, no, no, no orienting. Good luck. Yeah. And, uh, but like you were, you texted me earlier, like it, it, it starts to like click, like there's like an aha moment where it starts to click right around where we're stopping today, right around like yeah. in the 60s when the kids show up. Um, yeah, like, okay, cool. Like, I have some footing now. But, um, and first reading it, um, you mentioned this too. It, it does remind me of like, um, like indigenous writing from America with like, with like names that stand in for something bigger, right? Yeah. Symbolic, yeah. symbolic names and yeah. Absolutely. And this sort of like the tone and some of the, the humor felt a little bit like reservoir dogs, um, or reservation dogs, I mean, um, like a little bit. But yeah, I had that, and, and the the orality of it, I think, was the other. Mm-hmm. And this isn't to like connect ne- necessarily like uh, in indigenous populations, but there there's something to that. And there was I found an article that was like the feature it was written in on February fourth is when it came out in the New York Times about Alexis Wright and a little bit about how at, the title is at seventy three Australia's most important Aboriginal writer is making her mark, and it has a bit about like her background. And part of her background was that she went to all of these remote outback towns um, and was like employed by the Aboriginal elders to just write down notes at community meetings where people were telling all the stuff about their particular town and to get that down and write it down. And I, I assumed it to, for like various like political reasons, such as like their sovereignty, since Aboriginal, the Aboriginal people aren't like don't have their own sovereign nation and are have been from, you know, without without even looking at the, any sort of research, have been mistreated by the Australian government for, you know, hundreds of years. So you can just assume that and know that they've been on been in Australia for ever, apparently like 60,000 plus years, but like they're not recognized as, as a group by the government and are mistreated in various ways. So she worked on like that oral part of it. And I think that that really comes through and is like a key point here. She says something in here where um, that part of it was like a training to like, it was good training. They were teaching you to listen and they were teaching you patience. Um, And I think that that's true within this book too. Like mimicking that sort of orality and like the telling, it's very repetitive. There's like long sections that sort of retell what you just told, but like in a slightly different way. Like that there is like a patience that you need to be able to, to get into it. And then the other thing that I thought was really noteworthy is that there was, first of all, four months ago, they held a national nationwide referendum whether they should establish a voice, is what they keep calling it, voice, a constitutionally enshrined body that would advise the Australian government on questions related to Aboriginal affairs. And this, this referendum was shot down. 60% of the people voted against it. And apparently, like, both it was like a minor step it wasn't like accomplishing what the aboriginal population would have liked but also the whole campaign to get it passed became like mired in racism um and in and in various forms of misinformation which you know shocking like we're not gonna suffer that for the next fucking eight months as we like slouch to our apocalypse but um the other thing that's interesting that was mentioned here that does directly tie into the kids section and that I, I, again, just not aware. And I feel like just ignorant and like, maybe you should know more about Australian history and politics and contemporary stuff. And I don't. But in 2007, there's a reports of sexual abuse of Aboriginal children in the Australian news media. And they, the government imposed the Northern Territory Emergency Response, which they refer to as the intervention. Measures included banning or restricting alcohol sales or pornography, requisitioning land and welfare payments, and stripping back protections for customary law and cultural practice. And the basic vibe between it, behind it, was that all these Aboriginal people are just pedophiles and are preying on the Aboriginal Aboriginal children, um, which is that which is again part of this book. But as another yeah. like instance of like something that like seemingly wasn't 
truly accurate and leads to like, you know, banning of liquor and pornography. Like what the fuck? Like I would don't not do well. And that, that sort of, <laughs> I've got to have something to live for. Come no, on. Really, like, I mean, right now I get out of bed in the morning to watch Jordan pool have low lights. So we're already like pretty low bar. <laughs> <laughs> for living, but like take away pornography and booze and woof. But like that, that the whole treatment there is like such a fundamental part of the beginning of this book. That and that's the part where yeah. like, I don't know this. And like you get hints of it, like I, you can immediately be like, the white Australian government fucking hates us and doesn't treat us right. I got that. But the level of this that's that's in here is that that's real life happening. And this book is so contemporary, like it's so wedded to being a contemporary mm -hmm. moment of this moment book is like really important to kind of know <laughs> that is like a backdrop to like figuring out like the relationships and what their their sort of like vibe is for the their whole culture well you know like there's the saying misery loves company i'm just so happy to hear that uh there's other countries besides the united states that treat their indigenous <laughs> population like shit <laughs> it's not just the whew, all right cool which you should mention that you are you are part in part Native American as well, correct? Uh, yeah, I have a card carrying or whatever because I look so Native, right? right. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, I, I am, and my daughter is. Uh, my grandfather was half, so yeah. Which which but, uh, um, tribe are you? Uh, Choctaw. They're one of those uh, Trail of Tears tribes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, what, what I find like really fascinating that I'm going to kind of keep an eye on. I, I, I feel like it's might be kind of integral to the whole, whole book is this kind of intersection that you're seeing of like, I mean, this first section is called new gods, but this idea of like Twitter meeting people that are trying to like get back to the roots of, you know, take back the earth and take back the land, like take back and, and seeing this intersection of, of like progress and, like how progress is destroying things and then how do you leverage and how do you change like adapting with with those things that are you know that are destroying you and using them for something else um so it's like I, I think that seems really interesting and then this idea of like things that are supposed to be good for everybody though but they're not good for you right yeah you like everybody else is going to get this and like this but it's not good for you and this isn't for you and so this this idea of uh, of being like treated separate, um, I feel like that's something that we're going to see a lot of in this as well. So I'm really looking forward to how she explores that. Yeah, I totally agree. It is like uh, within that too. Like uh, I think it's interesting. One place to start maybe with like recapping the section, getting into the specifics of it, is that it kicks off with the haze. That there's a haze that's descended on this this region. That's like oh uh, no, not a toxic airborne event. A toxic airborne event. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And uh, she is noted for like in various of her books being like ecologically focused and having like eco oh, yeah. sort of vibe to it, right? And there's a comment that she makes somewhere about like I mean these people have been fucked by the government forever and survive, but like how prepared are they for like ecological catastrophes that are going to happen? How much? can you rely on anyone as this, this situation gets worse and worse, given that the government doesn't seem to treat you with any sort of dignity or respect. Um, so like that, I thought that like this, that framing everything and beginning with this point of like nature is also really interesting. And when you're talking about like the gods or the new gods mm -hmm. and how that plays out, there is that kind of element within the Aborigines, uh, Aboriginal customs of like their re relationship to gods and myth and like, that that sort of nature being incorporated into that storytelling seems to be both both prevalent here, but also in their general history. Yeah, I, I mean, just like the first the first line here after like Oracle One speak, beginning with story. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, for some people in the world, for some people, but not so, <laughs> but not so like more perfect for others. There lived a culture, you know, dreamer obsessing about the era. So it's like, yeah, once upon a time and stuff was great, but maybe not so great for some people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that sum is what I circled. That was the first thing I circled is that sum is doing a lot of work there. And like, and like yeah. And then this like, just runs throughout. It's a wonderful, it's like this wonderful humor. And 
that's really kind of all you have left when everything gets taken away from you. Like I'll give a great example. I don't know if I told this story or not um, on one of our episodes, but um, my wife and I, we were driving, I wanted to drive through um, Cheyenne country when we were driving across country. Mm -hmm. And we stopped at this gas station that was in the Crow reservation. And it's right by where uh, I wanted to see where Custer got killed. Little Bighorn. I wanted to see where that, what that looked like, uh, you know, feather in the cap for us. No, but um, so we, we stopped at this gas station and it's like, you know, it's, it's a Indian reservation. It feels like a third world country. Um, it's, it's terrible. And there's this like NPR looking guy, uh, driving a Subaru Outback with, you know, every bumper sticker and on demand on the back of it. And he's like, well to do. You can tell he's pretty wealthy. And the, there's just like this, like sad, long faced Indian behind the counter. And he goes, how, how do you say thank you in your language? <laughs> and the, the person like looks up like, really, we're doing this? Like, All right, please, how do you say thank you in your language? <laughs> and she goes, oh, oh. Oh, he takes he takes the receipt. <laughs> and then behind him is like this six foot five, uh, like Indian in a Pendleton, like waiting to like get his bag of chips. He goes, "Many a hose, my friend, many a hose," and he like waves goodbye. <laughs> the greatest. Uh, I want to do something with it one day. It's, it's like this perfect scene of just like, oh, great. More white people love it. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Can you move, please? I'm trying to get type two diabetes here. You're like getting in the way of that for me. Like it was so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like right in the shadow of Little Bighorn. Like all this is it's taking place, but like the that that sense of humor, right? Like I I, I can sense that in, in like on the first page here. Uh, yeah, wonderful. absolutely. I I found one that like this is what I named the episode after and was kind of going to be like probably my line of the week, but I'll find something else. But on page nine, where it's talking about the, the haze that's, that's descended. Mm -hmm. Nobody's, nobody can get rid of the haze. Nobody, nobody knows what to do with the haze. The haze is there. So the local people followed up with physicality by having a boxing match with the haze's curse on their kind. The people stood out in the atmosphere, punching their curse <laughs> in the guts, cursed and swore, but nothing. <laughs> Just love <the> haze. <laughs> <laughs> they're punching the curse kicked it in its guts fuck yeah that's, that's like a perfect meta that's a perfect metaphor for life like how's it going i'm just punching air you know <laughs> taking this out <laughs> that's my my yelling at clouds metaphor for the day but they piss, it's, piss off ghost <laughs> there's a lot that comes up in color now that i'm flipping through this too because there's a uh, the point where um don't guys trying to get the mm -hmm the 50, 50 shades of gray yeah the 50 yeah. shades of gray <laughs> it's, it's, it's love it was lovely i love the the imagery on that was wonderful it was a, that oh, was a yeah. great section yeah absolutely so we have a couple of characters that are induced here like ice pick also referred to as major mayor he's ice pick because he turned so so white now a man like this became known as ice pick a kind of more than albino who had covered himself from head to toe in a labyrinth of Casper the Ghost tattoos, mermaids, and octopuses, but you could still see the, his power blood coursing under the translucence of a spirit man's skin. Um, so you get introduced to him, but he's sort of like becomes, I, I, I think I'm remembering this right. He's more or less one of the people who's like ranting and like talking about how everything is sort of uh, like needs to go and is one of like the pontificators that they keep referring to like the the person out there just like kind of spewing forth and talking about, you know, the government and what to do and how to, how to live and get by. And is like big on Twitter. There's like so many Twitter references in here. I love that. It's like Twitter too. And not X like it's just before yeah. that, at that time. So like, it's like slightly, slightly mis, mis num, like a misnomer, but uh, all the references to like the fights on Twitter and the people who are like, Oh, I'm telling the truth on Twitter. Fucking wonderful. Cause that is like, the world that they live in. Oh man, I love that. And one of the things that stood out to me about this whole first section about the haze part, and they're sort of like, "What do we do about the haze? How do we deal with this? What are we gonna, you know, the government should help us. The government's not helping us. What's going on? Blah blah." blah. Is a kind of like endless runaround that also feels very contemporary and very like of everyone's time where it's like, oh, maybe this would happen. And then everyone kind of argues with each other. Everything kind of spirals out of control. Nothing gets done. Everything sort of stays the same, um, which is pretty interesting too. And like 
they they do refer to like the the sort of natural disaster part of it and then kind of argue about that as well um and like the ineffectiveness of the government in dealing with it which we all know is like you know both true and nature is a hard beast to contain yeah it, it, it's it, it's painted pretty thick uh the um like the the ecology and the uh like there's a wonderful image that I really liked was like people wearing goggles so they could look under the water and see the buildings of Venice. Like that's, that's the way that like, that's the way tourism is going to be going. We're, we're going in this direction. <laughs> like that was, that was so cool. Like, wow. Like, I, uh, yeah. It, it was such a neat way of neat way of looking at it. And the imagery in this is kind of just, it, it feels so foreign. Uh, it's, it's really making, at least it's making me like, think and look a little bit different than what I normally would. Yeah. Um, with, with, with the imagery, with the, with the description, even with the, even with the like turns of phrases, they like, it does feel like, like it's a translation. I, I see what you mean. It's a, and <clears throat> I think it's a book too that I was finding. I, I think this happens with a lot of books at the beginning where it's like, you it takes a little bit to get into. Um, I'm reading it simultaneously, a science fiction book from South Korea that I'm using in my class, uh, Counterweight. And it takes like five pages, six pages of that to like orient to like, what is this fucking futurist world that I'm talking about? Like, what is, what are the references here? Like what's going on? You need to find like the pacing of it. And then like, after I hit a point, it's like smooth sailing, very quick read. This is a book that like every, even like last night, I was, I was reading the last few pages for today's today's episode i was like god i have to go so slow i need to slow down yeah. moving too fast the pace, missing the it. pace is so, so i had to read it so 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 slow it took me forever to read 60 something pages same here uh, and I I like, oh, i'll give myself 90 minutes or so that should be plenty and <laughs> it was like 30 pages in i'm like what the heck i was like how many words what's the word count per page on here what's wrong with me and it's you just have to slow down because yeah, it's so weird. Like, how can it be this dense, but then also that slow? Like, it's yeah. And there's and it's slow, and yet there's like such a lightness to it in terms of like those mm -hmm. jokes and that that sort of tenor and the way that certain beats land. Like, there's another one that I saw that was that's very funny. Like, there's like kind of like how it says it'll say say something, describe something, go through that something, and then like have like an extra little little bit that's kind of a joke that 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 comes out so where is it it's the part about widespread or, yeah planet or widespread or cause man steel all the same names um they're talking about what he wants to do it's planet so he was a one of the power schemers um trying to like figure out what to do he said he hustled too many schemes about what other people should be doing and said the word because too many times big deal <laughs> it's like such a funny like way of depicting the character and then having this sort of like you know commentary that's also kind of a joke and addresses the audience and like reflects on what just was said and i really love that and then you know in all things his big current plan was to build an empire that was bigger than the haze that would blow it clean away <laughs> and, um and this is where it relates to the cut the, the idea of like the the government when that the truth be told, it was easy to see why praiseworthy's people thought they were being saved by anyone other than themselves and why they were sniggering that widespread's ideas were unpalatable, unthinkable, or in other words, a piece of shit. Since he was always thinking about how he knew best in any given situation about survival, like nobody else is interested in thinking about the indigenous man's preoccupation about surviving in his own country every single day of the last 60 plus millenniums, nor that nor that they did not know that they were already enduring the thing with the big flash name called the Anthropocene. Sorry. Even though they did not know what was what it was or could even pronounce the word, or if he had told them that it had something to do with the world ending from man-made overheating of the climate. That is one paragraph, one sentence that goes through all these kind of machinations and deals with both addressing like who would save them, the fact that they've survived for so long and have made it through all these things, the fact that this is man-made overheating of the climate, which is also, you know, horrible and terrible and is referenced in there. All of this stuff is packed into like one sentence about why people don't trust this character that we've just in, in, been introduced to. And the, the beat of like, or in other words, a piece of shit stands out so well as like a little joke within this like long, difficult sentence with multiple 
multiple uh, M dashes and various other like twists and turns to it. A traditionally run on sentence. Yeah. It, it reminds me in some ways, like when we, when we covered Ducks Newberry Port, and like mm -hmm. you had to kind of like get used to this different flow and cadence. And then there's almost like a formula that starts, like you had started finding, I think you got high enough at one point where you started figuring out formulas for, wait, there's a structure to, to these to these run-ons. Um, <laughs> and like the like, of things, yeah. yeah. Like for me, like a great example is on 41. Mm -hmm. This is a, a great, it's a great paragraph. Um, yeah. I probably read it fast and I missed it. Uh, but you come back and read it again. It's like, oh, okay, this really clarifies stuff up. Like this helps make sense of things. Uh, sure, it was a feed for the haze. Why not? Make Planet the epical supermarket of hate story. The fat haze loomed heavy with story after story being pumped into the air, taking more oxygen than was necessary from the atmosphere. In these stories, widespread feral donkeys became complicated plot lines of everything that had ever gone wrong and praiseworthy from the beginning of colonial oppression and the symbol of great fallenness, like an ugly fallen angel looming in minds as big as a cyclone, a hostile hurdy-gurdy bringing everything from thousands of kilometers away, roaring in winds that had no place in the world of the haze. Like, that's like a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, conk, like that. And like, that's just like square in the middle of like, Ugh, like how mm. how are you doing this <laughs> it's really wild it's really impressive it's, it's really wild it's intimidating it's like it's really intimidating like i feel like you're wrestling a big like everything in australia wants to kill you like this book wants to kill you too like and you got to be like really careful wrestling with it it's gonna freaking bite you <laughs> absolutely uh, it's it's, it's su like it's super impressive uh that it can be like like you said that light this complicated, that meaningful, that's deep, like historical, but also funny. And even though I'm confused as hell, uh, I'm finding myself more and more entertained as I'm turning pages. Uh, like I was doing something like, and she just makes it sound like, like she's shaking it out of her sleeve. Like, it's like, what the hell? How do you do this? Yeah, it feels, I mean, it does have like such an oral quality. There, there's a book that I always talk about, I use in my class by Adam Thurwell called, um, the delighted states it's about like translation but like international literature whole overall and how it influences various people it's a very interesting book but like the 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 sort of tone of it is as if you were at a bar with at with adam and he's like so the whole history of literature is about a wheelbarrow and you're like what and then like eight beers later he's like rambling and telling and going all over these places and you're like going along and then you get it to the point and you're like all right fucking is about a wheelbarrow I totally agree with you like it's that kind of like <laughs> wide like just telling yeah. him, just sitting at the bar, hitting the shit. So there is like the plot point that, that comes out of this section, aside from like the haze is descended, it's there, but is that widespread or planet or Cosman steel that he uh, <clears throat> decides that what he wants to do is to create a tribe or a, like a herd of donkeys because when you can't have like diesel fuels anymore or fossil fuels or cars or whatever, donkeys are going to be like the the way to travel. You'd be able to use these donkeys to go golf on that fucking golf course from like hole to hole to hole. Um, you'll need 20, you'll need 500 donkeys for that. But uh, so he's trying to get all these donkeys. He's obsessed with this gray color that he has not been able to find in the donkey, but he's getting all of them because that is going to be his like his pyramid scheme or his way of like, creating like you know becoming the uh, the first aboriginal billionaire and like defeat essentially climate change by having his like you know of donkeys <laughs> when we can't drive anymore so do you, are you doing uh for the intro music this season are you doing australian bands or like what are you are there australian bands aside from in excess zing no just them oh that just takes us back to now i'm picturing bluey's dad hanging Yep. Yeah. Me too. And uh, yeah. yeah. Oh no. That's what, that's what I'm yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a band, uh, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Oh yeah. Um, and they're really big into a lot of their songs. Are like, there is no planet B, or mm -hmm. like something apocalypse. Yeah, like it, it's always about like the earth, <laughs> the earth melting and stuff. No. What's uh, what's the band? Midnight Oil. That's the one that you get. <laughs> just put it in the chat. Midnight yeah. Oil. Mid Midnight Oil. Right. Uh, uh, white white people saving aboriginals with a song <laughs> yeah god i probably will try and do that i usually like to use songs i just like but like 
th- this will be this will work for that. This will work. Could do, we could do we do King Gizzard for sure. They've they've only got about seventy eight albums. So and they have two new ones since we started this podcast. Yeah, but, I think there's another one since we started this. Guy. <laughs> they they drop podcasts faster than anything I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, so there's all that. That's kind of the scheme that we have so far, or like what's going mm-hmm. on. Um, and then the thing that I mean, there's so many bits to that that I think are so funny. So and the part that like I was referring to, like how the the sort of conversation gets all crazy and everyone disagrees with everyone and like nothing gets resolved and everything's like it is in our world where it gets just like stuck in a morass comes up with this where he's gathering all these donkeys and people are like we don't have these fucking donkeys here man like stop it no donkeys and then they're like what about you know let's let's pass a law so that there's no feral animals and like but you know there's some feral animals that we kind of dig like that pig that everyone refers to as their aunt we got to keep that we'll make an exception we'll make an exception <laughs> You do all this first. We need the shame. We need the shame pig. How else will we make fun of each other? We don't let the pig be around. Yeah. It's so amazing. Uh, and then you get to like this paragraph on 51 that's just brilliant. The town's officials reached out to him. So they said, in the end, they're just like, screw it. All the dirty donkeys need to be cleared out of town. The town's officials reached out to widespread with bucket loads of text messages, mentioning their contrivances with fake niceness, then getting down to the tin tax on us, homegrown sour, and nasty barrel loads of insults, canceling him through their social media accounts. They wanted him dead to the world and felt nicely vindicated for having ramped up the importance of their new official bylaws about prohibiting all feral donkeys. He ignored them, and in turn, they said, fuck that. All feral donkeys must die. When good people are bothered to reach out in good spirit, they do not expect insults. Not at all. These were go- official local government people, after all, who had gained their positions with bribe votes. They were almost assimilated, not a bunch of idiots. Who did he think he was? <laughs> such, a, such a good section. And like, and I love, there's parts just reading this aloud or reading it with that, that like with the pacing and letting the pacing dictate your reading instead of like, trying to get through a certain number of pages it's brilliant this book is brilliant so far it's really like unique and has a great great tone to it same and then it really was on page 59 where last night like I'll, i was having these bits have them marked they're things i really liked had like a sort of idea of things and then it was when his sons get introduced that is like oh i am all in I am totally in now. Like the first one is called, it's called Aboriginal Sovereignty, which he named. He didn't want his wife to give him some dumbass like white person name. Paul. (laughs) (laughs) He had to insist on the name to save his firstborn from being called something stupid that dance was scratching from the bottom of the barrel of common English names that Australian white people generally called their children. I think there's one like Paul. Yeah. One Australian type of name for a son like Paul or Pauline if it was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I did think there's a moment in reading this though, with this with this character first, with the Aboriginal sovereignty, where references that he has he wears his red baseball cap. And then on the next page, it talks about how his dad's like, you know, you need to like is 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 thinking about his son and how he would uh what he what he from that side sees and that it refers then in inwards or like internally in the son's thinking that involves stuff like you know being yelled at the police cars the pistols aimed at his head and the intimate fear of running like dogs accused by the state of being pedophiles and that's a i think that that's a really interesting moment where like inside of the kid's head has all these fears of like what would happen with this outside world with the outside white uh australian government world and like the way that they're being treated um that that's really interesting and the red baseball cap reminded me immediately of holden caulfield and his people shooting hat um which then led me down this path of like who are her influences like you could see things in here and I'm, i want to go read some interviews with her in which maybe she she addresses this in the new york times one she mentions carlos fuentes and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and James Joyce, which, you know, that's, those seem to track beautifully. I mean, the sure. Fuentes book that this most reminds me of is Terra Nostra, which is also like this epic of Mexico and the creation of, of like the relationship between Spain and Mexico and the indigenous populations. And is like, you know, fabulous, super giant, long, wild, like wildly told book. And this has that feel, but it, like, it's interesting to think about like who her, like, who would be her influences are going to be a lot of world authors along with, with Australian authors. 
And that's very cool too. And you do see like this, the the Joyce thing for sure, Gabriel Garcia Marquez for what they refer to as the magical realism aspects, but that kind of blending of myth that Fuentes does, like it's there, but I'm curious, like as we go through, like what other, what other sort of like more internationally known authors will we be able to pick out of here? Um, I don't know that that Salinger is necessarily one of them, but that kind of set me off down that road. And there's also like those kind of hints of Kafka in the sense of like the bureaucracy is a nightmare and nothing works. Everything's like all jacked up. Um, and, and that's it's funny. It's, it's dark and it's funny, right? Yeah, absolutely. Finding, finding the humor and the absurdity of these big machines crushing individuals. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like, and I was like, like a great example of that is like on page 60, um, uh, where we, we first get introduced to Absov, as he said, like, as he's called later, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. In the, middle, in the middle of page 60, like, uh, perhaps his stolen property was somewhere scattered in bits and pieces that were carried away on the back of ants escaping down into their world underneath the ground. Like, even that sounds like mythological. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the the ants have carried it. Like what happened to this thing? Like oh, it's it's broken into pieces, carried away by ants, and taken underground to never be seen again. Right? Yeah. Like just like little things like that, where it's like sprinkled in. It's like like it's like really beautiful and interesting and neat, uh, but somehow feels like rooted in authenticity, even though it's completely it feels completely original. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Like really. Really. Really slick. It's very cool. Then we, after that, we get to meet Tommy Hawk, <clears throat> who is amazing, who is my that's favorite. Be my, that's my spirit animal so far, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Hawk is, Tommy Hawk is where it's at. Give me, give me a fat little kid, I'm all about it. Let's go. <laughs> this is the funniest <laughs> shit that I've ever, I've ever read. This part where Tommy Hawk, get here. Planet yelled several times to the tubby little brown-skinned boy with golden curls, the eight-year-old youngest son who ignored anyone who did not address him as Jedi or Ninja. <laughs> He did not look Jedi-like, <laughs> more like a ninja, but just a fat boy, a law unto himself, was following his more superior brother, the song of the country, lightness itself, gliding up the street. Planet watched this this other heavy on, on con, this other heavy unconscious no show go slow son, a child so unlike himself, and thought back to how he called it when Tommy Hawk was born, as seeing nothing in the baby but a bloody little fascist. <laughs> That's right. I'm calling you. <laughs> <laughs> And that there's a joke involving calling a baby a fascist. Like I'm looking there, and then Tommy Hawk steals it. He wants to get out because there's pedophiles everywhere, which he's he's become obsessed with the media and the news and like the seemingly more right wing reactionary sort of news outlets and and repetition of this. And that he's convinced that they're like he will be molested. There's pedophiles everywhere, and he's get away. And also that his parents have suck because they won't buy him an apple phone or an apple ipad so that he can experience the like real world where there's real thoughts and real things happening instead of this nowhere ass place where he's forced to grow up where there's just surrounded by pedophiles my my line of the week uh i'll do it now since we're right right there yeah, it was yeah. on 63 it's uh it's the top of 63 it's this paragraph here fucking tommy hawk planet thought bugger you should have let your silly mother Name you moron or whatever dumb arse name she would have dredged up from the ditch of the ugliest baby names in the world. He wondered why he wanted to call his kid a good solid name from country like Daruki, which was his real name. Nope, forget it. The kid was not worth it. <laughs> uh, father, father of the year. <laughs> There's so many bits of this that are so fun to to read. I mean, so many of my favorite lines I've already read out loud. But if I was going to make one more, um, uh, I think uh, I think it has to be this one, just because I think this is representative of life. Uh, he saw himself not as a person, but transformed into a door of hatred that went wham, flew open, and wham, sl slammed shut. Widespread challenged the whole town to bring it on, hate for hate. He pivoted hate, wrapped it, flung the thing, sent a hate bundle in all directions. It was a battlefield, hate flying here and there. Yep, let everything be destroyed. The winner take the flattened moonscape. Who wanted to win anything in this mess? <laughs> it's like such a fun bit. It reminds me Chad of that. identifies with that. <laughs> I, I, I was, I've been watching the show Beef, and I was like, the first couple episodes it's on Netflix with like Ellie Wong and uh, I forget the other guy, mm -hmm. the guy's name. 
<clears throat> but he's a, also a pretty well-known actor. And it's like the minor car road rage incident expands into like basically like fucking each other's life up over her <laughs> period episodes. And first couple episodes, I was like, this could have been my life a thousand percent, like on a bad day and something happens. I just become like laser focused in ruining that human being's life. Like it was, <laughs> like a, it's like a, a, a potential alternate reality biography of sorts. But <clears throat> anyway, so I have to wrap up here because I need to go to another meeting, but I do want to plug too for anyone who's still listening. They did post a new article, essay piece on 3% about Enrique Villamatas and reading and statistics of how many books people read and what the overlaps are and what you would be able to like know of, a, of literature given like how many books there are and how like limited we are in time that we can read. Hopefully people like it. It's up there. It's pretty fun. Um, <clears throat> you know, anything you want to plug, Brian? Nothing at all. Uh, I started watching that new Shogun show. It's actually really good. So if you want to I wanna watch, watch a, something cinematic, I, I watched the original one. Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah. That was, what was like in the 80s or something when it came mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So I did watch that one. But uh, this one's really good. The production value is pretty fantastic. So I had no idea Australians were writing about Japanese, which are directed by, you know, this one actually has a lot of Japanese people involved. So it's cool. They're, they're trying yeah. to get some more authentic uh, representation of the the book. So that's kind of cool. And I heard, I heard that the, um, the, the kind of white savior character from the original version, his voice is like truly downplayed in this one. Um, and that is more expansive into that world. Um, which that was cool yeah, too. he's like a he's like a lovable uh, piece of shit. Like he's he's great. He's uh, multifaceted. So it's it's really it's, re it's really well done. It's cool. I'm gonna check that out for sure. So next week we'll be back um, probably on Thursday, but we'll see. And we'll be going up to page 133, um, which is up to pit chapter 26. So I think we're still in New Gods. Yeah, we're still in New Gods. So yep. got that. Should be fun. And until then, you can rate review us leave comments um you know, tell your friends to listen to the podcast you know make us popular all this stuff helps and we will see you next week many a hose many a hose